وسلم اجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا الا ما علمتنا انك انت العليم الحكيم ولا حول ولا قوه الا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the blessings of iman and for the blessings of attempting to do a'mal salihah in particular that to come together and to fast this blessed month and to expose ourselves to the sweet breezes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy through it this is a very very special month this is a month that the believer that like the way that we're supposed to feel in the masjid we feel in relation to the month that our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam reminded us that a believer feels very comfortable in a mosque whereas the munafiq someone whose faith is not complete if they have faith at all is like a bird in a cage when the believer is in a masjid is that we find we feel very comfortable and by extension you could take an analogy is that this is the way that we should be in relation to the month of ramadan we should love fasting we should love the month why because we are literally basking in its light exposing ourselves to the mercy of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nothing is more important for any muslim on the face of this earth wherever they might be but especially of those who live in a country like this where the vast majority of people around us are not fasting is that we have to recapture this amazing sense that still exists despite all the problems in the muslim world it still exists people know how to celebrate the month of ramadan people know how to be in the blessed month of ramadan and to this day if you travel throughout the traditional muslim world is that you will see amazing things happen in this blessed month and you will see amazing acts of kindness and charity and that people coming together that to not only fast but to also break their fast and this is something that you and I need to think very carefully about how can you and I experience this month in the lands in which we live because it was meant for us to experience and that part of that experience is inwardly having farah and happiness that we are in it and that we are going through it and one of the the wisdoms and calling and saying to each other Ramadan Kareem is because that Ramadan is Kareem it is a month of generosity in terms of what it is that we experience from the generosity of Allah Jalla Jalalu but also in terms of what we're supposed to exemplify into those that are around us and that we should give in this month in ways that we don't give outside of this month but alhamdulillah we thank Allah Ta'ala for bringing us here and to expose ourselves to that which will benefit bi'ithnillah ta'ala that I wanted today to look at in a very overarching fashion a few meanings and to share with you a few reflections on surah al-hujurat this chapter a great chapter of the Quran which is so important in so far as it relates to etiquettes of society and it gives us a road map of what a healthy society must be like what has to be present in society for it to really be built upon solid foundations and obviously even though there's only 18 verses we're not going to be go through a detailed tafsir of the entire chapter that could actually take the entire month of ramadan if we go in detail but in a very overarching way we wanted to highlight some of the important aspects of this chapter so that when we hear it recited in tarawih when we read it when we're doing our own individual khatam is it will be reminded of some of its meanings some of the later scholars have that said that this chapter of the quran even know that the foundational reason it was given its name is because of the hujurat the chambers the living quarters of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the word hujra is one word that you might use for just a room but it could also be used for a living quarters a dwelling of someone and that our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is that he had hujurat and nine in fact uh, for his f- different families that were living in them and it takes its name from this incident that took place when a delegation from the tribe of Bani Tamim came but they came during the middle of the day and they in a very rude way called out the prophet's name from outside that very abruptly and even what they said was not the very best way to address the rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam is that referring to their own tribe and that when they are for something that this is a way of praising them when they're against something that's their this is disgracing and then the prophet corrected their understanding about what it is that they said but this wasn't the proper manners to have with the rasul and so some scholars say that this this that this is 
uh, the scholars mentioned that this was the incident that led to the revelation of this chapter in the Quran, the Surah. But it's also been referred to as the chapter of akhlaq and adab, the chapter of traits of character and manners, etiquettes. And specifically, that it refers to social etiquettes, etiquettes that relate to society. And if you look through the chapter that in its entirety and you trace the various etiquettes and that you really think about what needs to be there in the fabric of society in order to keep it together, you will find that all of the things mentioned in this chapter are essential. They have to be there right at the heart of the, any, any society. And this is what we believe as Muslims. So this chapter begins with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that saying to the believers, Ya ayyuhal ladheena aamanu la taqaddimu bayn yaday Allahi wa rasulihi wa attaqullaha inna Allaha sami'un aleem. Believers do not push yourself forward in the presence of Allah and his messenger. Be mindful of Allah. He hears and knows all. And that here that la taqaddimu that what this is really like it say la taqaddimu. Do not to embark upon doing something that before that you're told what to do by Allah and the Messenger of Allah, i.e. that learn to be people of ta'a, of obedience. Learn to be people who do what it is that they're told. And we have to remember, even though this is a very unpopular notion in the modern world, that our deen from the beginning to the end is based upon submission. It's based upon submission. It's rooted in submission. This whole deen from the beginning to the end is built upon submission at the level of belief, at the level of practice, and at the level of morality, character, morals, whatever it is that you want to call it. Entirely it is based upon submission. Now the fact that we have a, that rational backing for what it is that we believe, that's a secondary matter. But in its origin, it's based upon submission. And this is something that should be beloved to the believer. This is something that we should not have any intellectual hang-ups on. Is that ultimately that we do what Allah says to do. And this is a part of our being abd. But in a society that is becoming increasingly narcissistic that really thinks is that they are the measure by which everything is measured, that they really are at the center of the universe in a very egotistical sense. This is going to be increasingly hard for people like that, this whole idea of submission. And so we have to be very clear about this, is that what a blessing to Allah, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to learn how to just submit to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this first verse that points to this meaning, the importance of submission, the importance of obeying Allah and the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this is right at the heart of the matter. And if you really think about it, it's the only thing that makes sense. Why? Think about how many people lived before us. And think about no matter how many things that you consider when the decisions that it is that you make, that how there are so many different factors that are beyond your ability to consider. Even if you do your part, there are certain factors that are beyond your ability to consider. Who would have thought at the start of the Industrial Revolution roughly 200 years ago, or more than 200 years ago, that we would have gotten ourselves in this ecological mess that we are in now. No one would have thought that, that this wasn't questioned in the beginning stages. Even at the turn of um, the, the last century, these things were not questioned until that we started to see the detriment on our society. And what I'm really trying to get at is, we are oftentimes very short-sighted as human beings. And from here that we can understand the importance of wahi, of revelation. Is that Allah who created the heavens and the earth and created the human being knows best what it is that we need. And we oftentimes that are so short-sighted by, and especially because the nature of the hawa, the desire, is that it's volatile. Is that it comes and it goes. It comes and it goes. And so to the degree you could say that we follow our desires, to the degree that we that subjugate ourselves to the volatile nature of the desires is to the degree that we will be living in the moment and we will forget about the consequences of what's going to happen in the future. And some of the conversations that are taking place now, if you really look closely at them, they're almost that a little bit ridiculous because of the frame that's set. 
when we talk about just the, the collective increase of temperature and how that if it, it gets to the four or five degree mark that we're talking about human destruction. And so even framing the conversation around trying to convince people to live in a way that's sustainable enough to not have it by 2050 increase by two degrees, that we're missing the point. Because okay, we make it to 250, 2050, what about after that? What about if the world is actually around by the year, year that 2100? And that what's going to be that the state of human beings and the world in which we live? So if we get back to this, is that there's plenty, especially if we study mega crises and mega trends, that for us to know the importance, even from a rational perspective, of submission to Allah and His Messenger, is that He has given us the methodology that we need to live here on earth. And that if you look very carefully at the verses that start with You will find a detailed description from this verse until the end where Allah Ta'ala speaks of the slaves of the All-Merciful who tread lightly upon the earth. And if you just take that one principle and apply it to how it is that we interact with Mother Nature and with everything that is around us, you will find that human beings have fallen extremely short. So this first verse wants to set the tone of the importance of obeying Allah and the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi And then what follows closely behind this, then we have several verses that teach us adab with the Prophet Sallallahu So at the heart of this matter, at the heart of a Muslim society, of a Muslim in any society, is obedience to Allah and His Messenger and adab with the Rasul Sallallahu Allah says, Ya you a lady amen, la tarfa waswatu kum, poko so tin nevi, while at Hajhal la hobel holy kajahri bali kuni baldin, and tahbata amadu kuantum, la tesh arun. Believers, do not raise your voices above the prophets. Do not raise your voice when speaking to him as you do to one another, or you do good deeds may be cancelled out without you knowing. And then Allah says that. It is those who lower their voices in the presence of Allah's Messenger whose hearts Allah has proved to be aware. They will have forgiveness and a great reward. And then they go on, and this is now that where Allah Ta'ala is directly admonishing this delegation from Bani Tamim who so rudely spoke to the Prophet ﷺ, but most of those who shout to you, Prophet, from outside your private rooms lack understanding. It would have been better for them if they had waited patiently for you to come out to them, but Allah is all forgiving and merciful. What do we take from this? We take from this the importance of having etiquette with the Prophet ﷺ. And this etiquette is not just for those companions who are in his presence during that time. Is that this etiquette should translate into a way of being that stems to this very day and age. Is that why is it that we hear the Prophet's name, that we say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? And I think we take this as granted, for granted as Muslims. If I would ask some of the brothers in here who converted to Islam, and they might have been from another religion, and if you've ever heard how in other religions some other people of different faiths speak about their prophets, it makes you cringe. And growing up in those religions, you didn't know any better. But when I became Muslim, and then when I heard how Muslims respect the prophets, and every time we mention the prophet's name, we say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We mention another prophet, we say Alayhi Salatu Wasallam. That is amazing. The utmost respect is that we mention after their name a prayer essentially of something that we are wishing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them. And what is inherent in that prayer are no, a number of deep meanings that of course include that acceptance with Allah and receiving of His mercy and so forth and so on, which of course all of the prophets will receive and have that been given by Allah Jalla Jalalu. But just by mentioning the prophet's names and mentioning right after them in these blessed ways, is that it teaches us respect. It teaches us that prophets are not like other people. They are bearers of revelation. And why do we have to have adab? Because we just said that everything is based upon obedience to Allah and His Messenger. 
But how do you and I know the will of Allah if it's not through the messengers? It is through them. And so it is setting up just as outwardly is that if you that know that you're shipping something that is fragile and that could break, you put a sticker on it that says it's fragile so that people will take care of that thing and not break it. And just as there are a number of things outwardly that are precious or that are expensive, we take special care of those things. There's almost like a special unsaid etiquette that we have with those things because that we realize that they're valuable. And likewise, then we talk about the most valuable thing of all, which is deen, which is the knowledge of Allah and His Messenger. And our way to it, the methodology that we spoke about that stems from obedience to Allah and His Messenger, you have to have etiquette that goes along with it. And this is one of the great traits of the believers throughout the centuries, is that they are known to have adab with the Messenger وسلم, and that if you find earlier in previous times, some of the great hadith authorities, it was a prerequisite for them that those who were saying the blessed words of the Prophet and instructing others with the Prophet's words and teaching them, they had the utmost etiquette. We hear amazing stories of Imam Madak, Imam Madak, the Imam of Dar al Hijrah. When he would be asked questions about fiqh, is that he would oftentimes just answer them if indeed that he knew the answer. But when he was asked questions about hadith, what did he do? He would go inside his home and he would take a ghusl, he would take a purificatory bath, he would wear his very best clothes, that he would burn that nice smelling incense, and then he would go out and he would teach people the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. And Qadr Iyad mentions that a story of the Imam Malik, then one time when he was narrating a hadith, is that he was stung by a scorpion 17 times as he's narrating the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, and he refused to stop narrating the hadith. Now, I don't know if anyone's ever been stung by a scorpion. I've actually seen someone the days when I was in Mauritania, they get stung by a scorpion. And I've personally never seen anyone as in as excruciating pain as I've seen this individual. Excruciating pain. They liken it to just like, fire just it, like burning from within inside you. He was stung 17 times while he's narrating the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Despite that, is that he didn't want to stop narrating it out of adab. And that the scholars mention is that when we hear the Prophet's name, and he's the one who told us, Al-Bakhir man dhukirtu andu falam yusalli alayhi that the miser is the one whom I mentioned in his presence and he doesn't send salams upon me. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Is that every time that we hear his name and every time we hear words that are his and attributed to him, the adab is, is that we imagine them coming from the mouth of the Rasul himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and from the blessed that uh, endeavors of the ulama, especially of hadith and muhadithun, is that we have the scholarly tradition have reached us in such an amazing way. So we have access to the blessed words of our Prophet ﷺ. But this is where it begins. After the obedience of Allah, etiquette with the Rasul ﷺ. That we don't speak to the Prophet ﷺ in the way that we speak to other people. Is that Allah Himself, that in the Qur'an, addresses the Prophet that in different ways. Ya al muddathir Ya al muzammil The Prophet, the Allah Himself, that yet you and Nabi you, he speaks to the Prophet himself that with the utmost etiquette and teaching us the way that we should be in relation to Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then that after mentioning this, Surah Al Hujurat goes on to speak about the very first most important etiquette before going to maintain that a society that is going to be sound. When Allah Ta'ala says, Ya you will in Amr in Jaakum Fasiko Minabe and Fatabe, you know, and to see you come and be Jaharat and Fatusbi Halama Fatum, Nadi mean that, O oh, you who believe that if a Fasik, that if that a, a corrupt or immoral person comes to you and brings you news, that ascertain it first, check it in case you wrong others unwittingly and later regret what it is that you've done. Look at this, this is amazing. That what is Allah teaching us here? We are not supposed to be people that get caught up in gossip. 
We're not supposed to be people to get caught up in rumors. That anyone who says anything, that we just hear that and then we repeat it, and then we take part in oftentimes the spreading of falsehood. That we are people that, that we have either tabiyan or tathabut, because in one qira'ah, fatathabatu, is that we're supposed to ascertain facts. Not anyone who says anything, especially if it relates to someone's reputation. Are we supposed to just take what it is that everyone else says? Is that we have to make sure that the sources are true. And in general, if it is just hearsay and the person who is saying something to us is unsure, or it's possible that there could be another interpretation, we are not allowed to just accept what it is that they are saying. And even in more general, that we should be people that instead of bringing bad news to people that we want to bring good news. The righteous like to be bearers of good news and they don't tend to like to be bearers of bad news. Yes, sometimes there's things that you need to clarify, but we should strive to be bearers of good news and to say things that make people happy and to say things that bring people together and so that we have to ascertain the truth of various things that are, go that are being said, especially if the one who is bringing that news is not someone who's upright and that not someone who he himself or herself has checked facts. Because as the Quran says here, is that you may, that without knowing, harm other people and then regret it as a result. And anyone that's been a victim of that lies and rumors will know how painful it is to actually go out and to that be with people that you've known and that you had good relationships with. And because of lies or rumors that were spread, all of a sudden things have changed. Is that you no longer have the purity of the relationship that was there before. This is something that is intensely painful. And people whose hearts are alive that realize what they've done will surely that realize that this is something that is displeasing to Allah Jalla Jalalu. And then Allah Ta'ala says, وَعْلِمُ أَنَّ فِيكُمْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ لَوْ يُتِيعُكُمْ فِي كَثِيرٍ مِنْ عَمِلْ لَا عَنِتُمْ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ حَبَّبَ إِلَيْكُمْ إِيمَانًا وَزَيِّنُوا فِي كُرُوبِكُمْ وَكَرَّحْ إِلَيْكُمْ الْكُفْرُ وَالْفُسُوكُ وَالْعِسْيَانِ أُولَئِكَ هُمَ الرَّاشِدُونَ Allah Ta'ala here is speaking to the believers and that reminding them that among them is the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and in so many different things is that were he to just do what it is that you wanted to do you would suffer. This is amazing. And there are multiple hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that state, were it not to be that I fear hardship from my ummah, that, that, that I would have done this. Were it not to fear, be that I feared hardship from my ummah, I would have done this. And even the tarawih prayer that we all are praying is that the reason that the Prophet ﷺ no longer prayed it publicly with the companions after doing so for a few days was out of what? He feared that it would become an obligation upon them. So throughout the, the, all the different moments of legislation of the Prophet وسلم, is that he was concerned about making things too difficult for his ummah. And if it would have been just the way that we wanted to have been, we would have caused ourselves to suffer, but out of his mercy. But then he gives us this criterion that, and this sign really for a healthy believer that Allah is the one that habbaba ilayna. He is the one that, as it says here, Habba bi ilaykum al iman. Allah made iman, faith beloved to you. And He that adorned it in your hearts. So not only is it beloved to us, that He adorned it in our hearts. And then He made distasteful to us, He made dislike to us three things kufr, fasuq, and isyan. Kufr is disbelief, fasuq is like rebellious behavior. And then that Isyan is known. This is disobedience. That he made this distasteful to us and said that those who are of this trait, they are the ones who that, that are the Rashidun. And then after this, that Allah Ta'ala goes in verse 9 and verse 10, is that he then speaks about the importance of Islah. And Aslaha Yuslihu is to rectify. And what's it called in Arabic is islah that al bain rectifying between people. This is one of the great traits of a believer, 
This is one of the that acts that if you do it are the most beloved of acts of all to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rectifying between people. And the opposite of israh is you could say on one hand ifsad, but the worst type of ifsad is what is called namima. He's going to speak about riba a little bit later. It's going to be mentioned in the verse. But namima is tailbearing. Tail, tail bearing. It's sowing disruption and seeds of sedition in the hearts of the believers. It's pitting people against one another. It's mentioning bad things to other people about other people. What we want to do is we want to be people of Islah. We want to be people who bring people together. And this is why that Allah Ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً We all know this. Indeed, that the believers are brothers. فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَ أَخَوَيْكُمْ so rectify between your belief, between their two brothers. Rectify between them. And we should be very wary of this because of it is something that is commonly said to a lot of people. It was said to me when I became Muslim that you are a part of a family that is then like one billion deep. And now it's one point something billion, 1.5 or 7 or whatever it is. You're part of a family that is 1.5 billion deep. But then as you become socialized into the community, all of a sudden, okay, don't be around these people. Don't have a good opinion of these people. Be very careful about these people. Is that you've become Muslim two months into it and there's already a long list of people that you can no longer that like or be, spend time with. And then you spend enough time, all of a sudden that number of 1 billion then or what now is 1.5 billion, is that it's shrunk. And then eventually that not even people in your same masjid, only a few people, and then it's like only like one or two people that you can actually spend your time with. And this is a serious problem. Is that we have to love all people who say La ilaha illallah. Our Prophet himself in the Hadith al Shafa'a, that he will be there on Yawm al Qiyamah for anyone and everyone who says La ilaha illallah one time. Now I'm not saying that there's not differences, there are differences. And we have to be responsible though with those differences. But at one level, as our Prophet that exemplifies this reality, you and I have to love the people of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, the people who say the shahada and who that face the qibla and pray towards Mecca and establish the five daily prayers. We have to love the people of Allah. And we have to realize that Allah has set us up as a family. We are as a family. And again, there's such a beauty in this. The common acknowledgement. When we're traveling, do we not, those of us who travel, get excited when we see Muslims? And you just send salams to people that you don't know? This is a beautiful thing. This really is a beautiful thing. And I've traveled widely throughout the Muslim world. And one of the things that is, just brings joy to me to this day is how you could literally show up to most masajid in the Muslim world and have no context and no nobody there and there will be people in that masjid that host you, that take care of you, that introduce themselves to you, that want to get to know you, that want to establish a relationship with you. This is something beautiful and this is something that we should do is that especially in days like this, that in a place like this where an extremely diverse gathering, Afshu salam we should spread peace amongst ourselves. Say salam alaikum to your brother, to those that you know, to those that you don't know. Get to know your brothers, learn about them, learn about where they're from, and appreciate the diversity because it is a sign from Allah Jalla Jalalu. So we need to do our best to maintain the brotherhood of Islam. Don't worry about what anyone else is doing. You worry about yourself. What can you and I do to maintain the brotherhood of Islam? How can we treat people in order to maintain the brotherhood of Islam. And this is the real big question and that how can we live up to the, this verse, what Allah Ta'ala is saying to us. And then that Allah Ta'ala moves on to speak out about a very harmful tendency in the community. Ya amanu, la yaskhar qawmun min qawm, that Allah Ta'ala says, that believers that let not one of you ridicule another that perhaps that those people that you're ridiculing are actually better than you. Sukhriya is a type of ridicule. And this is something that is very detrimental. 
and where there's a fine line between tasteful joking and between ridicule. But you have to always be careful. One of the things that really causes problems in marriages, I'm not joking, this is real, in marriages, as in brotherly and sisterly relationships, is that joking gets out of control because there's a little bit of truth in the joking and then that you really are trying to jab at someone and they don't realize and eventually that it might actually take a toll on the relationship because in, in they realize that you're somewhat serious even if you're presenting it by way of jokes. So we have to be careful with this and there's a fine line between the two but if it turns into ridicule where you are making fun of other people, whether you are calling them names, whether you are speaking about them in a way that is not noble. Allah has honored Bani Adam. So who are we to ridicule Bani Adam? لَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا Bani Adam. Allah Jalla Jalalu has honored Bani Adam, the children of Adam. So who are we to ridicule people and to look down upon them? This is not something that we want to do, is that we want to get our tongues accustomed to saying good things and mentioning good things about people. And then after this, that Allah Taala speaks about something else very important that acts as glue in society. And notice here that these verses that we're taking now, Allah is speaking directly to you. He's addressing you. Oh, you who believe. So we should listen very carefully. What is being said? Allah is addressing the people who believe. And now He says, Avoid having too many assumptions, too much conjecture. Is that some of these assumptions, some of this conjecture is sinful. And that we're taught by our Prophet as well, to be very careful. Be aware of conjecture because of all speech, nothing is closer to lying than it. And you just see someone doing something and you think in your mind, oh, this is what's happening. And our Prophet is saying that oftentimes that conjecture, those assumptions that you're making in your mind are actually not true. They're actually closer to kithab, to being a lie, than they are truth. But if you think about that having a good opinion, how important this really is, and how sometimes when we don't implement this, we actually prevent other people from changing. We do not deal with them in a way that allows them to transform themselves, to allow them to get better. We need to be very careful how it is that we view one another when it comes to intentions that people make. Definitely because you and I don't have the ability to split someone's chest open to determine what was their intention in the thing that is that they did. And that as long as that it doesn't mean that we don't allow people to harm ourselves. No, we're wise and we put everything in its proper place. However, is that in general we need to have a good opinion of people that are around us and so that we can that build our relationship with them based upon a solid foundation. And then that Allah Ta'ala that speaks now about a few other the important things to avoid. Wala tajassasu. Do not spy on one another. Wala yagta ba'dukum ba'allah. And do not let one of you backbite another. Ayu hibu ahadukum and yakul lahmihi maitan karehtamu. Is it does one of you one of you want to eat the dead flesh of his brother? This is something you dislike. What taqullah? that have taqwa of Allah and Allah tawab and rahim indeed that Allah is that all forgiving and merciful subhanahu wa ta'ala so three things a tajassus is spying on people that looking into the details of their lives to prove that they are a certain way is that this is not from the sunnah of our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is that we accept people at face value and we don't pry into things and then also is that avoiding that riba. And that riba, unfortunately, is something that is very widespread. And there is a weak hadith that indicates that it will actually that nullify the reward of your fast. 
So in general, that we don't want to be people who commit riba, but especially when we're fasting, we, we need to learn to control our tongue. One of the things that we're mentioning in the khutbah today is how we should approach Ramadan like a madrasa and learn in Ramadan ways of being that spill over outside of Ramadan that we can hold on to as well. And one of the greatest things that we can learn is to that guard our tongue. When our Prophet taught us it was a hadith in Bukhari that as-sawm junnah, fasting is a protection. It is a protection, yes, in the eschatological sense of what we could face in the next world, but it's also a protection here in this world. It's an amazing protection. When you and I are fasting and we're outside in society, we're interacting with people, do you not feel like a bubble of protection? I know I do. When you're fasting and you're walking among other people, and it's not just because you're worried about your that foul, bad-smelling breath. Just in general, you feel in a spiritual sense that a protection, this is what our Prophet says, it's a junnah, it is a protection. And that glimpse that we get a feeling that it's a protection is from the blessing of doing a, a form of worship in which that we are resembling the malaika, the samadiya of the malaika, angels don't eat or drink. And that when we that resemble the angels, there's an angelic-like presence that Allah Ta'ala gives the one fasting that's a source of his protection from everything that is happening around him and helps him or her put into perspective that their life and how it is that they should be focusing in their very day. But guarding our tongues is of the utmost importance. And that what is riba? What is, if someone would ask you, the definition of riba? It's not the common definition like other people think that, oh, I would say that in front of his face. A lot of people say that. They say something, you shouldn't say that, oh, I'd say that in front of his face. Just because you say something or wouldn't say something, that's not the definition of riba. Because if it's harmful and hurtful to someone, even if you say it in front of their face, it's still haram. That riba is to mention your brother or sister in a way that they dislike. It's just to mention something about them that they dislike. But the, the difficulty is, it doesn't just relate to them. It relates to everything associated with them. Their clothes that they are wearing, the bag that they are carrying, the car that they are driving, the house in which they live, and even their children. And everything related to a human being. And so we are taught that we can't say anything about anyone that they would find distasteful if by mentioning that thing or criticizing that person in that way, that it's something that they would genuinely dislike. What a beautiful deen. And then the scholars of Ihsan go even further. They say, don't even let a thought of riba come to your heart. It only becomes haram in the sacred law if you actually say it or actually do it. Because sometimes that you could just look at someone and they know what you're saying, you're making fun of someone else because of something they're doing, and that look or that wink or that nod is itself riba. It's backbiting. But the truly pure is that they don't even let riba come to their hearts. They don't even allow themselves to commit riba that in their hearts. And that they fight themselves of having those thoughts and they train themselves to have nothing but goodwill towards the people of their own faith definitely and really towards all people. Because they want good for all people as our Prophet taught us and then, having mentioned all of this, and we will wrap it up here shortly so that we can all do our own du'as and prepare for the, the breaking of the fast, is that what is the whole goal of this? After Allah Ta'ala mentions some of the things that we need to avoid, and it's a mercy that He mentioned these things so that we can avoid them because these things disrupt the goal of Allah creating human beings and what it is that we can possibly attain here in this world. What does Allah say? Ya yuan nas. Now it is addressed to not just the believers. Before, Ya you alladhina amanu, O you who believe. Now it's people. Ya you an nas. Inna khalaqnaakum in dhakaran wa unta. Wa ja'annaakum shu'uban wa qaba'ila li ta'arafu. Inna akramukum and Allahi atqaakum. Is that, O people, is that we have created you, that male and female, and we have made you peoples and tribes, in order that you may come to know one another. This is amazing. Indeed, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah 
that are the most pious, the people who have the most taqwa, inna Allah, alimun khabir, Allah is all-knowing and totally aware, subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, is it li ta'arafu, so that you may come to know one another, is it so that you may come to mutually perfect one another? Is that the different colors of our skin, the different tongues that we speak with, is that these are all signs of Allah Jalla Jalal. And all of these different people that, have, that we see on the face of this earth have a common ancestor. We are really in reality all children of Adam and we all have the same father and we all have the same mother. This is the reality of the human condition. And what the Quran is saying is that all of these differences that you see is that it's really there for a divine wisdom. لِتَعَرَفُوا So that we can come to know one another. If you look at the beauty of this verse and you compare this to a theory like something like the clash of civilizations and that if it's not that, something close to that and even if someone doesn't necessarily know what that means that oftentimes people are working towards this knowingly or unknowingly. Look at the beauty of the Qur'anic, that ideal. And this is something that you and I cannot just quote and say and that's it. We have to live up to this. This has to be our perspective and how it is that we view that all different types of people from different places in the earth and what is the goal is that لِتَعَرِفُوا so that we can come to know each other and what a blessing it is that when we come to know each other how it is that we can benefit from each other and how it is that we can then that travel the path to draw near to our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala that together and that I think that we will limit ourselves to that there's a few more verses uh, in Surah Al-Hujurat but really that if you look at Surah Al-Hujurat with the lens that I mentioned and see it as a series of very important etiquettes, akhlaq, adab, traits of character, that etiquettes that are there to cement the society together and to, that allow us to build our relationships upon solid foundations. You will have new insights that come to you as a result of that. But again, as it all starts with our relationship with Allah and the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and He is the one that we want to emulate inwardly and outwardly. He is the one that we want to be like Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And especially in this month, is that we have these blessed descriptions of Him. And there's a hadith that indicates is that Gabriel used to come to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam every year to review the Qur'an with him in Ramadan. And that this hadith indicates is that the most generous that the Prophet was وسلم, was when he met Gabriel. And that Imam Manawi says about this in his commentary because the hadith is in Sahih Muslim. Is that this is one of the great fruits of being around good people. Is that it helps transform us and to lead us to be people of great virtue and of great traits. And so in this blessed month of Ramadan, as we get towards the end, we want to especially emulate the Prophet ﷺ, who was someone who was always devoting himself to Allah and to what Allah Ta'ala wanted him to do, but especially in these last 10 days. These are days that we want our hearts to be in a state of what's called iqbal. We want our hearts to turn towards Allah Ta'ala. We want to supplicate our Lord. We want to lower ourselves before Him. We want to be in His remembrance. We want to continue reciting the Quran. And then we want to ask Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala for acceptance for all of us and that all of us have all of our sins forgiven and that all of us receive His mercy and that these last days be of a special benefit to us and the Ummah of the Prophet wherever they might be on the face of this earth. As they say, Khawati Mubarakah, may Allah Ta'ala bless us in these last 10 days of Ramadan. Give us tawfiq in all of our different affairs and to give us new insights and new understandings in his book, subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah Ta'ala bless us to be able to follow the guidance of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam inwardly and outwardly and rid from our lives anything that is displeasing to Allah and his messenger and to adorn us with every virtue and every good. May we live and die upon la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And may the very last thing that we say when we exit this dunya, may la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah completely actualizing its meanings inwardly and outwardly. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen